Thanks very much. Um, I'm Andrea Burbank. I'm a data scientist at Pinterest, and I'm going to talk today about how we scaled data science by building a culture of experimentation. Uh, word of warning, I tend to talk fast. My observation is that you Swedes speak English really well, so hopefully that's not a problem. But raise your hand and I'll slow down. All right, here we go. Um, as data scientists, we think of ourselves as blending the best of sort of software engineering and statistics. And so when it comes to a problem like A-B testing, I think the first thing we tend to think about is how to solve it with that tool set. But what I want to argue today is that that's only a piece of the puzzle and probably the less important piece. What you really need to make your A-B testing program succeed is the culture and the people that will make it actually be adopted and used correctly. You may have heard of something like an organizational maturity model for software engineering. Instead of just writing code, writing code, writing code as fast as you can, you start to use source control, write unit tests, track bugs, and so on. What I want to propose today is an analogous maturity model for experimentation. And the thing with this is that I think no matter what point you're on, you don't really realize that you're only halfway up the ladder or only a third of the way up the ladder. I put five steps on my ladder. Maybe there's 12, and I'm only on the fifth one of those. I'm hoping I'll learn that from you after I'm done. What are the five steps I've seen so far? Getting started, getting big, getting better, getting out, and getting tools. What do I mean by all of those? Stage one is getting started. This is where you actually implement your A-B testing framework. The problem you're facing is people making bad decisions. Maybe they're just shipping products without measuring them at all. Maybe they're shipping them and then just watching what happens to the data over the subsequent days without taking into account that other things may affect those trends. Building an A-B testing framework can help solve these problems. For Pinterest, I joined in July 2012, and we decided to implement a new algorithm for categorizing our pins. And we shipped it, and we saw our traffic plummet. And we said, huh, maybe our categories algorithm isn't working very well. Or maybe it's just that the Olympics started last week, and everyone's watching the swimmers. And we frankly had no idea. So that's the point where I built an A-B testing framework. Not going to go into the details of the technicalities of that, but basically you take the population, divide it into control, which gets the default, enabled, which gets your new fancy thing, measure the differences. So I built the framework. You randomize the users into the groups. You log the things that happen. You track all the metrics. I built a little UI to show it. I ran some experiments on my own. I ran some AA tests to make sure all the statistics were valid. At this point, I've built an A-B testing framework. If this were my talk on software and data, I would be done. But at this point, you've actually only just gotten started. Yes, you have an A-B testing framework, but that's completely useless without people who are actually going to use it. That's why stage two is what I call getting big. The problem you have here is not that your framework doesn't work. It's that no one's using it. And I think, yes, this is obvious when I say it, but I think as software engineers and very logical people, we tend to think that a great product will speak for itself. Unfortunately, that's really not true. Even if your AB framework does all the things correctly and will help people make correct decisions, they've been doing what they've been doing for a while. Why are they going to add this extra friction to the process to run an experiment? On the same note, who here has heard of Pinterest? OK, good. So Pinterest now is very popular around the world, hundreds of millions of users and so on. But back in 2011 when we launched, no one had heard of us. Pinterest was a similar product then to what it is now. It was already an awesome place to discover ideas, but no one knew about it. So what did Ben, our CEO, do? He went to the Apple store in Palo Alto and San Francisco and all the ones nearby, and he went to every computer and he changed it to point to Pinterest so that people in the neighborhood would start to know what Pinterest was and start to use it. And that's the sort of thing you need to do with your A-B testing framework. You need to do marketing and evangelism and salesmanship. Give tech talks, give demos, find a strategically important project that your company is investing in and insist that you run an A-B experiment on it. Don't take no for an answer. Once you've done this a couple times and you've allowed Joe to step in front of your company and say his new growth initiative led to a 5% increase in signups and Kelly to come and say that our ads are now generating 20% more revenue due to this tweak she made, people start seeing the value of this AB framework. They start realizing that they can use it not only to measure what they've done, but to figure out which sorts of ideas are successful and what they should build next. At that point, you've succeeded at stage two. You've gotten big. People are actually wanting to run experiments. What's next? Getting better. So in stage two, 
Your problem was that nobody wanted to use your framework and you had to run around saying, hey you, please use it, hey you, please use it, hey you, look at this awesome experiment you could run. In stage three, people actually understand the value of experiments and so they're going off on their own and they're saying, hey, I think I'll run an experiment for this. That's really great, but the problem is they need guidance. Running an experiment, yes, it's fairly straightforward, you're randomizing, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And so whereas before you were always on hand because you were convincing this person to run an experiment, now people are doing it on their own and they need some guidance. And so you become the human in the loop. Every time someone wants to run a test, you help them, nudge them in the right direction and say, hey, are you sure you can actually measure that hypothesis? Hey, are you sure this experiment will actually work? Hey, do you really need to measure this on all 100 million users or could you maybe run a 1% sample? And that's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this phase. You know what's going on at the company because you get to look at every experiment that's running and you get to say, hey, this seems like a good idea and you're very connected to everything. The problem is, you're also a single point of failure. And there's not just one experiment running at a time or four experiments running, as I've shown here. As your company is growing and as the adoption of A-B testing is growing, there start to be more and more of them. For me, this really hit home when I was on my anniversary in Napa and had to get off my bike every so often to do code reviews for a really crucial experiment that was going out. Now, this came up more quickly for me at Pinterest because we grew from 50 people four years ago to 1,500 people today. But even if your company isn't growing at that breakneck rate, I would argue that this is a stage you still want to get out of. It is not your career goal to be the experiments person. You should have higher ambitions. Yes, it's fun to make sure that people are making better decisions and that experiments are succeeding, but you're also sort of just turning the wheels day to day. What else could you be doing innovating with your time and with your skills? So that's phase three, getting better. You're helping people run successful experiments. People are making better decisions. Your experiments are running correctly because of your help. Everything is peachy. And yet, you're a single point of failure. So what you want to do next is get out. And the problem you want to solve here is scaling yourself, figuring out what it is that you're doing that's helping these experiments be successful. Develop repeatable processes and guidelines and checklists so that you don't have to be that single point of failure anymore. So when I talk about generating those, what we did was we wrote down the process I was using. What mistakes are you seeing in experiments? What are the questions that people keep asking you? What are they going to get out of learning these things themselves? When I was writing this talk, I went back and pulled up the list I'd written at the time. Here it is. It runs to three pages, single spaced, of all of the mistakes that people were making when they ran experiments that I had to go and fix. When I showed this to the coworker I was chatting with, he said, if you let engineers run experiments, they'll screw them up in every way possible. I would rephrase that. If you let untrained engineers run experiments, they will screw them up in every way possible. So your job is to figure out how to train them, how to build up that culture. If you haven't read this book, The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, I highly recommend it. He talks about how even incredibly complex processes like open heart surgery or flying an airplane can be improved in their success outcomes with very simple checklists. It turns out when there's a million things to keep track of, sometimes having 10 of the most important ones there for you to look at can really improve how well you do. So how do you make one of these checklists? For every important mistake, explain why it's wrong and how to avoid it. Now, I just showed you three whole pages of mistakes. I don't want a checklist that's 20 pages long in single-spaced font. What it, so what we thought about instead was, what are the phases of running an experiment? For every experiment, there's sort of three major phases. When it launches, when you first run the experiment, when it's in flight and you want to make changes to it, maybe add new variants or change your groups, and when you land it, when you say, hey, I've run this experiment long enough, I have enough data, I have a decision to make. And so what we did was we wrote checklists for each of those phases. At launch, does your did you write down what you're doing? Did you put it into a document that other people can find? Does your document have a hypothesis in it? Is your hypothesis measurable? Is what you're doing actually likely to affect your hypothesis? These are very simple questions, and yet they're questions that people often weren't asking themselves. And so by having this dialogue with someone who's going to run an experiment, you can increase its likelihood of success. Similarly, in flight, you want to change this experiment, great. Does it look like it's doing what you thought it would? Is the group that you're expanding causing 20 million fewer people to visit Pinterest, or is it looking promising? Are the right number of people in there? Is your experiment broken such that you should start over? And so on. 
And lastly, when you're shutting down an experiment, do you actually have enough data to shut it down? Is your data statistically significant? Are you shipping the variant that actually showed the highest lift? And so on. Checklists. I talked about repeatable processes and guidelines. There you are. But a checklist is nothing, again, without people. Just as the A-B testing framework is useless without people to run it, checklists are useless unless someone's actually going to run through them. How do we get that process to work? So at Pinterest, we came up with this pro idea of experiment review. You all have code review. I sure hope if you don't, you should start that. And we had the idea of an R+, which is basically like, yeah, your code looks OK. Go ahead and check it in. It's not actually mandatory, and you can merge without it in a case of emergency, but it's a cultural norm that you use it. No one except an intern will merge code without an R+. And so what we did was said, hey, if your code is touching an experiment, please just ask for experiment help as well. We'll give you an E plus and say your experiment setup looks valid. We'll run through the checklist with you. And so we had this new concept. Instead of mentioning Andrea on an experiment review, you mention experiments help. And I think three things made this successful. The first is that names matter. We thought about calling it experiments on call because we would have a rotation of people to look at these reviews. Nobody likes being on call. Everyone likes helping people. Call it help. Second thing, get engineers to be partners. Have them realize that this will let them move fast and let them own the process. The badge value of certification also helps people want to do this. That avoids data science being seen as this gatekeeper that's slowing things down. It lets each team move faster by running experiments correctly. And thirdly, make those initial engineering partners the right people. Choose people who are thoughtful and well-respected in the company, and people will start to say, hey, John's telling me to run an experiment. Like Maybe I should listen to him. And so in the fall of 2013, we launched this Experiments Help program. We said, hey, there's a new email alias, Experiments Help. There's a new uh, at mention, at mention Experiments Help. Please, we're here to help you run your experiments correctly. Stop bugging Andrea. Start bugging us. And so now we have a process that we can follow so that we actually guarantee success for our experiments. We have checklists. You can mention experiments help in your code reviews. We have an E plus as part of the code review. We have a mailing list that you can just email and say, hey, I'm thinking about running this experiment. How can you help? A template for writing up what's in your experiment so you don't forget to say your hypothesis and you don't forget to say who you're measuring it on. And a rotation of experiment helpers. We don't actually have that rotation of experiment helpers yet, right? So far, I'm the only one who actually knows what all these pieces are in the checklist. So how are we going to train my successors? What we decided was it's really important to sort of do a trial by fire, trial by actual exposure. Yes, you can read the documentation as many times as you want and read through those checklists, and they're informative, but it's not until you're actually put on the spot that you start to absorb those lessons. And so we built a little quiz where we said, you know, here's a real situation. Which of these things would you do? And that's nice, but it's a quiz. You can look at the back, and you're like, oh, whoops, I got that wrong, and you move on. And so the last part of the training is you're actually on the hook for every single experiment change going out that week, and you have to look at it. And you're the one saying, yeah, that's OK. No, that's not OK. Hey, did you think about this? And then when a week later someone says, hey, you said that experiment was OK, but actually they forgot to put any users in the control group, then you can start to actually learn those lessons the hard way. And so we expanded our Experiment Helpers program from just me to me and Dan and John to me and Dan and John and Una and Cole and Chris and Everett and so on. And now we have over 100 trained Experiment Helpers on all of our different engineering teams. Different engineering teams are developing new processes within themselves to make it richer for their purposes. And it's self-propelling. I don't have to do anything at all. I'm here in Stockholm at a conference, and people are still running experiments correctly, not screwing things up, and adding to these checklists and quizzes as our processes evolve. So that's stage four, getting out. It'll, it's the only way to scale, but even if you're not scaling, it's crucial to remove yourself from the process so that people know why running experiments is important and can run them themselves. The other thing about this, the reason it's not the final stage, is that as you start to run more experiments, you start to see things that are going wrong more and more. Not that they're going wrong more frequently as a fraction of experiments, but your total volume is going up, and so the number of mistakes is growing. And that's where you enter stage five, getting tools. The problem you want to solve here is the simple mistakes. A lot of the things in experiments are things you really have to think about. Is this the right experiment? Will this hypothesis be measurable? You can't have a computer answer those things. But a lot of the mistakes that people are making are very simple and automatable. And they were happening at all of the phases of the process. 
And what we said was, hey, to the extent that we can build tools that let the humans do the thinking and let the machines catch the stupid stuff, we can reserve our brain cells and our time for the parts that actually need our input. Doing the right thing should be easy. Doing the wrong thing should be hard. And for us, that meant things like simplifying the API, automating logging so you couldn't accidentally forget to log people, which was what ha was happening a lot, making a dashboard that only showed significant differences so you wouldn't ship something based on spurious effects, differentiating novelty from long-term effects, segmenting important populations, identifying randomization errors, and actually hiding the entire dashboard when we think your experiment is broken. I could talk about these things forever, but I won't. Um, and so that's stage five, getting tools that will fix the simple mistakes so you can use humans for the hard part, which is the thinking. So that's the maturity model I'd like to propose. You go from getting started by actually building the framework, getting big by getting adoption for it, getting better, helping people run successful experiments, and then putting yourself out of business by training other people to run experiments correctly and care about experiments being run. And lastly, and I think this phase is always iterative, building better and better tools to remove the simple mistakes from the equation and allow people to make better decisions without you so that humans can focus on the thinking. As I said, maybe there's a stage six and seven and eight that I don't know about. I'd love to hear about it if you do. But the other thing I'd like to say about this, and I think it's a theme that's come up a couple times today, is that data science and data in general is not just about the software and just about the statistics. You're not going to have success with A-B testing unless you get adoption from your company about why it's important. But you're also not going to get success for your recommender model or for your new analysis of user segmentations unless you can convince people of why it's important. And that's a human part. That's a building a culture part. That's showing your value again and again. Data science, changing minds one at a time. Thank you.